Hello, everyone. This is a CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, January 8th, 2024. This is time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Liz, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafruit.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, please ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pins messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. First is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Belinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by numbers separate from our status updates. Third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes, talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. And the fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussion. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. And with that, we'll get started with community news and headlines this week. MicroPython v 1.22.1 patch release. MicroPython version 1.22.1 was released to address a specific race condition in using thread in the RP2 port. It has been, um, v 1.22.0 has been out since December 27th, so the period where the issue has been in effect is short, although it was present in preview build since November 9th. And then free Python for Kids tutorial with MicroPython and BBC Microbit. Python for Kids is a free comprehensive online Python development tutorial for kids utilizing a BBC Microbit development board going step by step into the world of Python for microcontrollers. And project of the week is sound localization with Raspberry Pi and Python. If you have multiple microphones in known locations, you can determine the time a sound arrives at each one you can actually determine the location that sound is coming from. This technique is referred to as sound localization via time difference of arrival. Kim Hendricks decided to put the technique to good use to track down the location of illicit fireworks launches. The build is based on the Raspberry Pi with Kim developing an autonomous recording unit complete with GPS module for determining their location and keeping everything time synchronized. By deploying a number of these units spread out over some distance, it's possible to localize loud sounds based on the timestamps they show up in the recording in each unit. This and more is available in our weekly My Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out via email on Monday mornings. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python on hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a PR on GitHub, uh, tag Anne Engineer on Twitter with hashtag CircuitPython. You can use hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon or email cpnews at adafruit.com with a link. And that is this week's community news. Next up is the state of CircuitPython libraries, and Blinka. 
This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, libraries, and Blinka. So first up overall, there were 12 pull requests merged. Those are by nine authors, BD Lucas, Jepler, Just Mobilize, I'm Not James, Cryer, How to Flow, Jen Volk, Maker Melissa, and AAL Hard. There were seven reviewers, uh, Brent, Jepler, Maker Melissa, Tectric, Dan Halpert, Lady Ada, Foamy Guy, and 15 closed issues by nine people, 15 opened by 14 people. And now we will hear from Dan for the core. Okay, so uh, last week there were four pull requests merged by two authors. Um, there were three reviewers, and there are now 23 open pull requests. A bunch of those are drafts, which are on hold for various reasons. There were three issues closed by three people and five issues opened by five people. There are now 694 open issues, and they're divided into milestones. So there are two issues open for the 10.00 milestone. Th those are changes that will happen when we start working on Certified on 10. We're not even done with nine yet. So, but those are things that we anticipate changing, usually uh, deprecating feature or uh, turning off features that have been deprecated in the previous release. Um, there are zero open issues for 8.2.x, which is nice. There are 49 open issues for 9.00, seven more issues open for 9xx, things that we would fix after 9.00 is out. There are 23 open issues having to do with libraries, 573 long-term issues, which are sometimes often just enhancements. Um, 14 issues are open because they deal, but they really support. Uh, there are 11 issues that are open because they depend on uh, third parties uh, doing something, so we're they're sort of blocked because of that. And right now, we have a lot of issues that are not have not yet been assigned assigned a milestone. Seventeen, uh, those need to be uh, triaged and labeled with the correct milestone. But uh, since I was out last week and Scott was out last week, not a lot um, happened in that way. So, uh, but we'll be getting back on track this week, and then Scott will be back. Um, Tuesday of next week. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Great. And next we'll hear from Foamy Guy for the libraries. All right. Thanks, Liz. This uh, section covers all of the CircuitPython libraries, which you can find on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library that you are looking at. Uh, all these libraries provide Python level code that allows you to interface with either uh, various bits of hardware like specific sensors uh, and other things like that, or provide helper functionality in order to just make it so that your user code uh, does not have to micromanage as many of the uh, specific complex details in order to achieve neat things. Uh, across all of those libraries this week, uh, we had five pull requests merged by five authors. Uh, a couple of the names that uh, stuck out to me as newer or less frequent contributors, uh, and I, I think Liz mentioned some of these as well, but just to say thanks again to these uh, folks that might be um, newer contrib contributors to libraries, uh, BD Lucas one Just Mobilize, I'm Not James, and uh, AAL Hard. Uh, thanks to those folks as well as uh, Jeff, our other offer, author. And then we had four reviewers uh, who are uh, more usual suspects, but thanks uh, as always to Brent, myself, uh, Tectric, and Jeff. Um, as far as pull requests, those five pull requests, the oldest one that was merged this week was 48 days old. The newest one was just one day. That leaves us with 58 open pull requests now. Uh, the oldest of those is 501 days, and the newest is just one day. Um, there were, over the past week, six issues that were closed by five people and nine new issues opened up by eight people, which leaves us now with 717 open issues across all these libraries. Uh, of those 717, there are 19 of them that are labeled good first issue, which is a great place to look if you are interested in uh, getting involved with contributing to CircuitPython. Uh, if that is the case, you can learn more at circuitpython.org contributing. 
Um, this would be contributing on the Python side of things. On that uh, web page, which I mentioned, circuitpython.org slash contributing, you'll find a list of open PRs as well as all the open issues. Uh, if you're looking to contribute, you can get started there. If you're interested in reviewing, you can check out those open PRs on the first tab. Uh, just take a look over the uh, PR, uh, take a look for code, um, you know, spelling, comments, all those sorts of things. If you have the hardware, you can go ahead and test it out, leave a comment uh, how it worked out. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved more so on the contribution of code, you can look at the issues on that contributing page. Underneath issues, there is also a drop down to filter by the different labels, uh, which is how you can filter it down to the good first issues, which are the ones that have been identified as good for folks who maybe don't have as much experience with uh, Python or microcontrollers or CircuitPython. Uh, so if you want to get involved but don't know where to start, uh, head there. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you to do if that's the case is join us over on uh, Discord. There's folks uh, around on the Discord um, throughout the week that can help you get involved with contributing in whatever way uh, works for you. We can uh, walk you through, point you towards guides for the, the version control, the Git and GitHub side of things. Uh, we can help you out with any issues that you are uh, running into. So uh, uh, head over there if that sounds like something that would be interesting to you. Uh, to wrap it up for the library stats, we've got some PyPy weekly stats for the week. Uh, there were, let's see, is that 52,103 uh, PyPy downloads of those 323 total libraries this week. Uh, the top 10 list is noted here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at that. Uh, and then the list of new and updated libraries here is relatively short, so I'll let you know that there was uh, LPS2X. I think that one is a new library, although I'm not sure what device it is. Uh, requests was updated this week, and there are a couple of new libraries over in the community bundle, uh, the Wave Builder and the Micro OSC library. Uh, so thanks to everyone who contributed those, and I will send it back over to Liz. Thanks. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Melissa for the Blinka stats. Hello. So Blinka is our circuit Python compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. Uh, this week we had three pull requests merged by three authors and one reviewer, which was myself. Uh, there are currently 11 open pull requests amongst all the repositories. Uh, about half of them were within the last day or two. Uh, there are were six closed issues by two people and one open by one person, leaving a net of 78 open issues. There were 12,283 PyPI downloads in the last week, 5,522 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 128 supported boards. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you. And that is it for the State of CircuitPython Libraries and Blinka. Next up is Huggerports. Huggerports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or are missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So I will kick things off with a group hug and then I will read uh, for Cedar C. Grover. Uh, Foamy Guy for suggesting bitmap tools to reduce a project's footprint, improve performance as well. Uh, John Park for the design and coding of the superb Fader Wave project. I'll be using it as a test bed for my Wave Builder demonstrator project and a group hug. Uh, and now we'll hear from Dan. Okay, uh, thanks to Jeff and everyone else who uh, covered while both Scott and I were away. I'll, I'll talk about more about that in status. Um, thanks to Jeremy A. Moore, ADCC, and Romkey for continuing to stay on top of the macOS Sonoma issue where it delays writes to uh, USB drives and continuing to submit feedback items to Apple, uh, though Apple is a black hole when it comes to these things. Um, thanks to uh, Justin for working on refactoring the network code, which is a very an overdue thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Deshipu. Okay. Uh, thanks to AT unique centimeters, I guess, for work on improving the file system support and the USB-C uh, support as well. 
uh, Bill 88T for work on uh, the settings and the web workflow in general. And thanks to Brad and Lane for uh, discussions on display AO and non standard uses of uh, e paper displays. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now I'll read for DJ Devin, who is text only. Uh, foamy guy for the Friday and Saturday streams, doing great things with Display.io. Can't wait to integrate his soft keyboard into my project. Tanut for everything he's contributed to CircuitPython and dealing with a personal matter and a group hug. And then we'll hear from Foamy guy. All right, thanks, Liz. Uh, first up uh, for hug reports for me, just group hug to everybody. Uh, super happy to be a part of this community. Um, did some thinking about that over the break with the new year and stuff and just really, uh, really excited to get going for this year and really happy to be around and um, have made so many friends and great connections through this community. So thanks to everybody for being awesome. Uh, thanks to Justin for working on the Connection Manager API. Uh, it manages the differences in networking APIs between built-in Wi-Fi and ESP32 SPI. Um, I think that's uh, really cool. Also, uh, Justin created a, uh, another little utility that can generate stubs files for uh, the board module uh, using values that it finds from pins.c files inside the core, uh, which I think is also a really, really cool functionality in order to have uh, stubs that know which pins are on your specific board or uh, potentially even just knowing which pins are valid um, for any board uh, across the whole project. But uh, both really, really cool things. Thanks to Justin for those. Um, thanks to uh, Tectric, I should say, just hug report. Nice to see Tectric pop back up. And uh, thanks for doing some work going through library repo issues and PRs. I do appreciate it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Jepler. Hello. Uh, I have a hug for Dan and Scott. They're both going through some difficult family stuff. Um, Scott, a little while before, and I didn't say anything at the time. So. Uh, correcting that, uh, my sympathies, and as as I think you say, uh, may their memory be a blessing. And, of course, a group hug, because it's great to spend time with y'all. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Justin. Yeah, I just wanted to give a hug out to Foamy Guy, who worked on Friday during the deep dive and tried out my connection manager stuff, which hasn't been accepted necessarily by Adafruit or anything like that. But really work through it without previously talking to me or anything like that. And um, it, it was just fun to watch him try to figure everything out and um, try to see if this is something that Adafruit wants to kind of go in that direction of. So thanks very much. Awesome. And now Maker Melissa. I just want to give a group hug to everyone. And that's it. Thank you. And now I'll read for Tectric. Group hug to everyone. Excited to be more present again soon. And it is good to see you back. And that was Hug Reports. Next up is Status Updates. So Status Updates is our time to tell folks what we've been up to individually. I will start and we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. And I will start. Uh, so I was able to take the past two weeks off to rest and recharge, um, but I did work on some electronics projects while I was out. I built a plant grow light for my mom. She has these two little plants that she'd been kind of moving around to try to get them some light because uh, we're in the Northeast and it gets dark pretty early. Uh, and this involved building a wooden flower box to hold the plants. And the lights I'm using are the Dot Star LEDs, and because they have the right color temperature to promote plant growth. And they're connected to a Cutie Pie ESP32 S2 running whippersnapper firmware that turns the lights on and off at a scheduled time. Uh, it was my first time using whippersnapper for a project, and it was really easy. And since this project is running at my mom's house, I can monitor it from my IO account for troubleshooting. And that's one reason why I didn't do CircuitPython. I kind of wanted it to be something I could easily manage uh, without having to take anything apart if anything went wrong. And then I finally got around to starting to modify a Meowsic cat piano that I found on the side of the road right before the holidays. Uh, I followed JP's guide on adding a line output, and I took out the very corroded battery compartment and installed an HUSB 238 so that it can be powered by USB-C. And I also added a power indicator LED 
because I was finding that to be pretty frustrating that I couldn't necessarily tell if it was actually getting power. Uh, and now I will read for C. Grover, who's text only. Uh, so wrapping up the tests for a SynthIO waveform wavetable graphic visualizer widget, WaveViz, a companion to the Wave Builder class. WaveViz accepts a SynthIO readable buffer array and creates a DisplayIO group object containing an oscilloscope-like waveform bitmap of any size or aspect ratio. The envisioned objective is to create synth waveforms with WaveBuilder that are saved to or retrieved from a library of sound sample files. WaveViz will be used to create thumbnails for each unique wavetable file. The remainder of this week will be devoted to creating and testing the wave file save retrieval code, hoping also to have time to assemble one of JP's fader wave PCBs. Fingers crossed that the Adafruit order of parts arrives on schedule. While testing WaveViz using a Feather S2 and a 2.4 inch Feather TFT wing, I occasionally saw a few miscolored pixels and edge to edge horizontal transparent lines. The symptoms were dependent on the bitmap's initial position and color palette, limited to just a few image origin locations. Was finally able to make it repeatable and drafted a CircuitPython issue. Before hitting submit, I disconnected all attached devices to confirm the error. Turns out that the unused and unselected and broken SD card on the wing slot was interfering with the display in a very specific and predictable way. Crisis averted. Very cool, and uh, Seagrover dropped a nice picture of his progress in the chat for folks to see. And now we will hear from Dan. Okay, so I was late uh, last week because my mother passed away um, on New Year's Eve day. Um, as you know, Scott's mother also passed away about a week before that. I we hope this is not a trend; it's just an unfortunate coincidence. Um, so I'm back, um, returning to continue work on uh, 900 issues, of which there are plenty to do. Uh, TAC has been working on uh, updating the you know, FW firmware for airlift boards, and is um, he's been doing, I'm not sure if he's finished with that, but I have to check on that. That's a new thing to check. And the week before, um, in December, uh, while a lot of people were out for the holidays, I did some extra forum support, um, which I do from time to time to sort of see what's going on and to cover for those people who were taking time off so we would be able to um, help people even during that slow week. Okay. Thank you, Dan, and so sorry to hear about your mom. Uh, next, we'll hear from Deshipu. Yeah. I didn't do much in the last month or so. Uh, I was out of commission. And uh, the plan is now to finally go and test the 9x version of uh, Cbit Python on my board to see what's broken, what doesn't fit anymore, especially with the new memory uh, management changes. Uh, I'm afraid there might be some problems there. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. And now I'll read for DJ Devon, who's text only. Uh, the Fitbit heart monitor I created to track my mom's heart rate came in handy this week, unfortunately. Had to take her to the ER twice over the weekend. Fitbit is not a medical device, but it can be useful for generic monitoring when I spend most of my time in front of a computer. Was able to catch her illness much earlier this time. Turns out we both have COVID. Sorry to hear that. Attempted to integrate Foamy Guy's latest changes for his new soft keyboard library into my project, but there seems to be an issue with indexes I can't figure out. Uh, and now we'll hear from ADCC. Thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, so first off, uh, the CC on ADCC is card columns. Uh, that's a shout back to my days with punch cards. Um, okay, so I enjoyed some time away from the computers for the holiday, and I hope everybody else did. Uh, discovered, interestingly, that uh, Mac OS Sonoma has two active implementations of its FAT file system drivers. The original that operates at kernel level, and the new one that operates at user level. Which one is used depends on how the file system is originally mounted. A manual mount invokes the original kernel level driver, 
while an automatic mount invokes the new user level driver. And it's that new user level driver that's broken that's giving us the delayed metadata write problems. And I'm also back to work on uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi 2040 uh, Bluetooth low energy, um, working through asynchronous event handling for characteristic value reads right now. Uh, BT Stack uh, delivers a large number of events that uh, it doesn't document. So I've been reading a lot of source code and doing a lot of experiments uh, to get things working properly. Uh, so far, I've been able to maintain parity with the uh, Nordic port. So uh, that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, I also took uh, quite a bit of time off. I've been relaxing mostly with uh, video games and building Lego with my wife. Uh, we started a couple of different new Lego projects, and we've been uh, working through them pretty quick, having lots of fun with that. Uh, I started to get back more into CircuitPython on Friday for the deep dive and over the past weekend. So in that time, I uh, checked out and tried the current draft state of the uh, connection manager proposal. Uh, took a look through that and tried it out on a device. Um, I did some digging into a core uh, issue that's um, created in GitHub that was in vector IO specific to using uh, the non-default rotations. So if you rotate your display by 90, 180, or 270, um, and you make vector IO rectangles, they can end up being a little bit too big or too small uh, based on the rotation. So I was digging into that. I did not come up with a solution, but I did walk away with a much better understanding of how Vector.io works and a couple of tests uh, of things to try in order to uh, hopefully learn more about it uh, and get more towards the uh, the cause and the solution. Uh, the other main thing that I uh, picked up over the weekend was my Pygame display library. I've been working on that off and on for a little while now, trying to get it updated to be compatible with the newest version of Blinka Display.io. Uh, I've had varying levels of success, but um, so far I seem to be in this place where I can either get automatic refresh or manual refresh working. Uh, once I get one working, the uh, the other doesn't, and then I go and dig around for a while and fix the other, and that breaks the, the first one. So I've gone back and forth a few times. Um, so we're not quite there, but I am getting closer, uh, feeling a lot better about it, and I have learned a lot about how Blinka Display IO works, which is uh, making it a lot easier. And I uh, didn't put it here in the notes, but I'll also mention that it's um, stretching my uh, personal boundaries on working with threads and things like that. So I'm getting a lot of experience on that front, which is nice. Um, but that's what I have got. Thank you. Great. And now we'll hear from Jepler. I can sympathize with the um... The, the fun of being thrust into the world of threads when you weren't ready for it. Anyway, um, so last week I worked on some um, functionality for the Memento camera, also known as PyCam. Um, in the examples for the library, there is now a JPEG viewer. It just uh, cycles through all the JPEGs on the SD card and displays each one for about eight seconds. Uh, then I started working on image filtering. So um, you know, like... Uh, blur, sharpen, sepia, and those kind of operations. And the first uh, way that I approached that was using Microlab. Uh, with Microlab, you can you know do bit operations. You can add two matrices of numbers together, and it's supposed to be nice and performant. Unfortunately, it wasn't as performant as we wanted. Uh, it would take from one to four seconds to filter a screen-sized image on the Pi camera. So um, I'm taking some inspiration and some code from the OpenMV project. Um, they have a what is called an in, image convolution filter. They call it Morph. Um, and you pass a convolution kernel to Morph along with your image, and it can blur it or sharpen it or perform some other kind of special purpose operations. And it operates on each of the image's three channels, the red, green, and blue, uh, with the same convolution kernel. So uh, that is in an, an open pull request that I think is a draft. Um, and Lamore in the internal meeting earlier um, kind of outlined some directions to take that in so that it is a more flexible image processing thing. 
Um, the OpenMV people, you know, they concentrate on things that are for uh, computer vision, and we're interested in what are the operations that people like to do on photographs. So we want things like sepia and redcast and bluecast and uh, invert and solarize that are more oriented towards just uh, looking at an image and creating an artistic effect. And morph alone doesn't cover all of that, but maybe with some additions it will. So that is kind of what is going on right now. And we'll just see where that goes. I'll probably work on it uh, most of this week, unless we get to a point sooner than that, that we're like, yay, this is done and we're happy. Thank you, Jepler. Looking forward to it. Um, and now we'll hear from maker Melissa. Hello. So <clears throat> I've been testing out hardware on the Raspberry Pi 5 and updating the scripts and guides as needed. Um, been working with the speaker bonnet, the voice bonnet, and I'll be doing the Braincraft hat next. Um, and then I'm also continuing to get more of the uh, Raspberry Pi setup scripts functioning with Bookworm. And that's about it. Great. Thank you. And now I will read for Tech Trick. Uh, fall semester of classes is over, and while spring starts shortly, I'm excited to make more substantial contributions again. In non-CircuitPython work, I've been working on getting a personal website up that runs on Flask, learning a lot about web development and web servers as well, hoping to take another look at my older PRs and resolve them. Adafruit IO Python for moving to pyproject.toml, a few PR reviews I said I'd take a look at if I assign myself to review. It, please don't hesitate to ping me so I don't miss it. Hoping to prototype a repository that uses typing stubs in an effort to remove the try accept block used in the libraries. I'll share what that would look like to see if it would still be helpful. I'm unsure if there's any specific reason that inline typing annotations are preferable to typing stubs, but let me know if there is, for example, Moo can only understand use inline annotations. And that was status updates. Next up is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for long form discussions that either come out of status updates or that folks have identified ahead of time. If you have any In the Weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things so we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. However, today there are two topics. The first by Tectric, who is not present, but I think folks here will want to discuss. Um, I will read what he left in the document. Uh, received an email that the Read the Docs projects need the webhooks in the repositories updated in order for triggered builds to keep working. And the text from the document, please manually, uh, previously manually configured webhooks from integrations did not have a secret attached to them. In order to improve security, we have deployed an update so that all new integrations will be created with a secret and we are deprecating old integrations without a secret. You must migrate your integrations by January 31st, 2024, when they will stop working. If you aren't using an integration, you can delete it. Otherwise, we recommend clicking on Resync Webhook to generate a new secret and then update the secret in your provider settings as well. You can check our documentation for more information on how to do this. It seems enough to go to the project on Read the Docs and click the Resync Webhook button. It's worth noting that I'm unable to do so for subprojects I've created within the CircuitPython Read the Docs project due to insufficient GitHub repository permissions. So someone with full permissions on both Read the Docs and GitHub needs to do it. Happy to help in any way I can. Please ping me about anything I can do. And Jeff has just put in chat, um, Adafruit also got a message about a bunch of repositories tried this with some of the Adafruit repositories, it did not seem to work. My assumption is that either something's not right at the organization level or my access level is not sufficient. And I see Dan's unmuted. So, so I, I would just say I, I, I was willing to take a look at this. And it is confusing that it seemed to work for Tectric and not for Jeff. So, um, but I'll, I, have, I have the privileges and, uh, and the read the docs admin account log in and things like that. So I'll try to figure out what's going on. Maybe just need to generate, in worst case, we just need to generate new new webhooks. And that's just a matter of a lot of clicking. So I'll do it in a way that doesn't um, cause um, carpal tunnel or something. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. And the next In the Weeds topic is from Deshipu. Uh, fake file file system and uh, Deshipu, would you like to read? 
Uh, right, so we had this discussion before Christmas, but uh, the last uh, meeting had a lot of uh, in the weeds, so I didn't want to add to that. We can, we can uh, just say uh, as we uh, want. So, so the idea is not really that new, uh, but uh, now that uh, we know more about uh, USB and about, you know, being able to have multiple partitions on the uh, USB drive, uh, we probably could have a fake file system in there, similar to how the bootloader generates a fake file system that is not actually stored or only stored. Uh, it would be read-only and it would contain uh, diagnostic data, basically status uh, data for the circuit Python, including the last exception, if there was an exception uh, when, when the uh, last program stopped running. And uh, the idea is that this could help a lot with uh, support. Uh, basically, we could ask people to, instead of linking them to the tutorial on how to get to the serial console, and ask them to see the error, and then usually they wouldn't even copy the error, they would just tell us uh, vaguely what the error is. We could instead just ask them, okay, upload this file, uh, to Discord, and then uh, we would have uh, the version of Circuit Python and the exception, the full exception string uh, in there that, that could really uh, help us with the support. And also on, on boards that don't have a display, uh, it would help people to, to see the error without uh, having to, to connect to the serial, which is uh, non trivial on Windows, for instance. And the additional uh, side uh, advantage might be, this might be also used by uh, Mu or editor plugins to actually read the error and display this to the user in a friendly way, maybe. So I, I know that there are some editors that have uh, this, this functionality. Vim has that, Emacs, Emacs has that. So, so uh, maybe we could even use that for this. So there is a link to the issue where there was some uh, technical discussion on this, uh, on different different ways this could be done. Uh, one one uh, possible downside of this, well, of obviously adding anything to all boards right now is a bit. Uh, tricky because we don't really have that much space left, especially on the smallest board. So may, maybe this would be <laughs> an optional thing that's not enabled on the smallest board or, or something like that. And uh, another tricky thing is that it will probably use more memory uh, because this, this uh, file system has to be kept in, in memory, in RAM. Uh, but uh, maybe we could only do it while uh, the system is in the rep, not while it's running the code, or something like that, to, to work around that. Anyways, uh, this is just to throw this idea out there. Right, mm -hmm. ATCC says that uh, the big issue is uh, with caching. And uh, in the in the issue, the, there are several links to possible workarounds for that. There are certain USB events that could be sent to to tell the file system to to clear the cache. Of course, we would need to do some testing, some additional testing to see how well that actually works. And uh, yeah, I, I personally I don't have the expertise to make that working, to, to experiment with that. I might uh, try it, uh, you know, to, to learn about it and, and uh, try something like that. But uh, I think it's something that would be worth a try, at least. Okay, that's all I have.
Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very nice idea. And the caching is the thing that we really have to look at. Uh, these events, these USB events that cause the host to, to uh, re, um, uh, reread things to force it to declare that it should flush its cache. I thought we were using these events when in, there's, a, there's an issue or a PR about multiple LUNs, logical units. And uh, it didn't seem that it worked reliably on all uh, operating systems, but it might have been a different event that we were trying to use for those. I'm not sure. It was, it, that was to try to get it to rescan to see that the, a new file system was available. And I'm not sure that the event is the same or not. I have to look at that. But that is really the thing that we have to see about, um, about that. But otherwise, yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Um, and, and, and it's very simple because MSC is always available and you don't need a terminal program or something to, um, to look at the output. Okay, that's all I have to say. All right. Um, so I think that will do it. Thanks, everyone. And this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, January 8th, 2024. Thank you to everyone who participated and those in the weeds topics. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit. And the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Actually, is next week holiday? Um, yes, it is. It it's is. Martin Luther King Day. That's right. It is Martin Luther King Day next week. So next week, it will actually be on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, in observance of Martin Luther King Day here in the U.S. Uh, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, when, which you can join by going to adafruit.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, such as next week, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>